In May 1940, the Western world experiences firsthand what a ruthless war this will be. It is the blind terror of swift, mechanized warfare, and the blindest terror comes from the sky. I'm Spartacus Olsen, and this is War Against Humanity, a special program of World War II in real time. It's really easy to see history as a row of facts, dates, and numbers. And sometimes these numbers are so incomprehensibly big that they dwarf the real meaning behind them. This is especially true when speaking of the casualty figures during World War II. So let's remind ourselves that one human killed is not just a bagatelle. And when tens of thousands die, another ten dead are not only ten dead. They are husbands, wives, boyfriends, girlfriends, mothers, fathers, sons, daughters, aunts, uncles, cousins, and friends that have lost a loved one. Death is suffering, and there is no such thing as only a few killed. There is only many sufferers for every death. And last month, perhaps that is what was on everyone's mind in Western Europe as the war came ever closer. In Scandinavia, Nazi Germany invaded Denmark and Norway and Finland. Hundreds of thousands were displaced from their homelands that were now to be part of the Soviet Union. And every single Finn mourned dead family members, as did hundreds of thousands of families in the USSR. In Poland, the Nazi occupiers were busy creating the Jewish ghettos, press-ganging Poles into German war industry, continuing to round up possible Polish resistance for execution or incarceration in Theodor Eicke's concentration camp system. In the German annex part of Poland, people continued to be driven out of their homes to make room for German-speaking Poles forcibly removed from the East by the USSR on Germany's demand. The Soviets were also rounding up possible opponents to communism and occupation, either mass murdering them like in the Katyn forest, systematically torturing them to death in prisons, or shipping tens of thousands to the gulags further east. In China, the war was causing both famine and immediate death as civilians bore the brunt of the costs of Japanese occupation and Chinese defense. Now, in May, the suffering of the Scandinavians, Poles, and Chinese will come to Western Europe when bombs start falling from the sky there too. The fear of future large-scale aerial warfare against civilian targets is already present immediately after the Great War. With increasing range, capacity, and efficiency of planes, it was clear that in a new war, the danger to the civilian population would be significantly higher. Voices are raised for increased preparedness for air raid protocols, gas masks for everyone, and air shelters. But in peacetime, people don't want to think of war and spending money on things like this when there are so many other things needed. When air raid training is attempted, it gathers very few, if any at all, participants. Plans for shelters get stuck in budget discussions, and as the years pass, it gets less and less focus. By the end of 1939, only a single digit percentage of urban population in Europe have access to an air raid shelter. And all of this, while the effects of modern aerial war aimed at civilians can already be seen in Spain and China. The idea is obviously to disrupt the economy, terrify the population and break the morale so that the enemy's war effort is broken down from within. Thus, the euphemism strategic bombing. During the civil war in Spain, General Franco's forces tried to bomb Republican strongholds in Madrid, Barcelona, Valencia, Mallorca, and many other places into submission. Both the German Condor Legion and the Italian Aviazione Legionara joined the effort to support Franco and learn more about the effects. The bombing of the village of Guernica, killing perhaps as many as 1,600 of the village's population of 7,000, outrages the world in 1937. And yet, the bombing goes on. At the same time in China, the Japanese also run test runs against Chinese cities, especially the Guomintang capital, Chongqing. When Germany invades Poland, U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt immediately appeals to all the belligerents to limit themselves to military targets and, 
under no circumstance and undertake bombardment from the air of civilian populations in unfortified cities. Germany, Great Britain, and France issue assurances that they will. But as you can see in our very first weekly episode from September 1st, 1939, when Germany invades, they start dropping bombs on Polish cities from the very first day. They claim that this is within the limits, as they are claimed to be fortified cities. And according to many military historians, like Hank Nelson and Frederick Taylor, Germany did, in fact, not have a policy of targeting enemy civilians as part of their doctrine prior to World War II. But something is changing, and some of the very first bombs that fall on Poland come down on the undefended town of Jelunge. Dozens of Stukas dropped 46 metric tons of bombs in four waves during the early morning hours of September 1st. With no air defenses to fear, the German pilots come in extremely low, enabling them to precisely target their drops. More than 75% of the town is destroyed, including a hospital and several schools. When civilians try to flee the bombs, they are strafed by the planes with machine guns. The number of dead is unclear. 127 deaths are confirmed, but it is probably hundreds more. The reasons for this specific bomb run still remains contentious in 2019. The town has no operational value and is not part of the main advance path, but by some accounts, the Germans thought they were cavalry units inside the town. In his war diary, German Chief of General Staff Franz Halda mentions a plan called Offensive Operation Red in the Vielunge area. While we don't know exactly what this refers to, the Luftwaffe launched several further attacks in the area and produced documentation on how effective the bomb runs have been on town infrastructure and civilian installations. As the invasion proceeds, the Luftwaffe continues to bomb civilian targets all over Poland. Reports of refugees strafed from the sky continue coming in. While the Germans continue to claim that the targets are in besieged areas that are fighting back, making them legal targets, the bombing of Frampol on September 13th provides us with another, more sinister explanation. Frampol is a military insignificant tiny town, population 4,000 in southeastern Poland. On September 13th, 125 bombers let loose 7 100 metric tons of bombs on the town, completely leveling it, except for two streets and a few houses on the outskirts. Again, Luftwaffe strafe the people as they try to run from the carnage, and half of the population, 2,000 people, are killed. British historian Norman Davis writes, Frampol was chosen partly because it was completely defenseless and partly because its Baroque street plan presented a perfect geometric grid for calculations and measurements. On the same day, the Jewish quarters of Warsaw are targeted with a mix of explosive and incendiary bombs, setting the quarters ablaze and killing hundreds. The bombing continues, and when Warsaw is on the verge of capitulation by 22nd of September, Wolfgang von Richthofen, the Red Baron's cousin, a Condor Legion veteran, and commander of the battlegroup Flieger Führer zur besonderen Verwendung, Air Command for Special Deployment, messages Hitler. Urgently request exploitation of last opportunity for large-scale experiment as devastation terror raid. Every effort will be made to eradicate Warsaw completely. Hitler rejects the request for total annihilation, but orders bombing to continue and that no civilians shall be let out of the city to encourage surrender. When the Red Army invades Finland in November, the initial attack is accompanied by bomb raids on Helsinki and other cities. These attacks are aimed directly at civilian targets to break the spirit of the Finns. When the international community protests, Soviet Foreign Minister Vyacheslav Molotov claims that there are no bombs. Despite widespread photographic and film evidence already circulating, he says that it's Nothing but humanitarian food drops. The bombs get the nickname Molotov's bread baskets. In the same month, November 1939, the Japanese conclude the last of 25 test raids against Chongqing and Wuhan in China. One raid on Wuhan alone results in 4,900 civilian buildings destroyed, 2,650 wounded, and 
3,700 killed civilians. The effect on morale remains inconclusive, and the effects on the defense capacity of the Chinese is negligible, to not say non-existent. The same can be said for Finland, where as you have seen in our weekly episodes starting on December 1st with the episode The Winter War, the Finns famously resist the much larger Red Army for months. If anything, the bombing of civilians only seems to have strengthened the Finnish resolve. Warsaw holds out for weeks under the bombs, and the population of the city is more or less forced by their own leaders to capitulate. By this month of May 1940, the Western Allies have held their commitment to not bomb civilian targets, and for the invasion of the Benelux countries and France, the Luftwaffe are also given orders to avoid purely civilian targets. If this is an admission that it hasn't worked so far, an issue of racism against Poles, or just a strategic consideration remains unclear. Nonetheless, in France, several towns and cities, including Nancy, Lyon, and Abbeville, are bombed as military targets, with at least 40 civilians killed. The Allies at first focused their bombs exclusively at troop columns and bridges, with the British War Cabinet giving permission for limited bombing raids against infrastructure targets west of the Rhine River. On May 11th, the day after the invasion, the Royal Air Force does indeed target military and industrial installation in Mönchengladbach, as well as roads and rail near the Dutch-German border. Four civilians are killed. The turning point comes on May 14th, when the Luftwaffe bombs Rotterdam in the Netherlands, partly as a result of a communication error. We describe this in some detail in our weekly episode about the week leading up to May 18th. In any case, if you disregard that the entire invasion of the neutral country Netherlands is illegal, legally speaking, the bomb raid is not a deliberate targeting of civilians, since the Wehrmacht is in fact fighting against forces inside the city. Legal or not, the effects are devastating. 57 Heinkel 111s drop a combined load of 97 tons of bombs. Fires break out with buildings continuing to burn through the day. As the winds pick up, the flames combine into a firestorm that rages through the medieval city streets and alleyways for several days, destroying four hospitals, 21 churches, 62 schools, 775 warehouses, 2,320 stores, and nearly 25,000 homes, leaving 78,000 people homeless. Over 1,000 inhabitants are wounded, and between 800 and 1,000 civilians die. The world is outraged, particularly when they read the erroneous newspaper reports quoting the Dutch legation in Paris' initial estimate of 100,000 dead. The Dutch legation in New York soon issue a revised figure of 30,000, which is then the number that international news agencies widely report, portraying Rotterdam as a city mercilessly destroyed by terror bombing without regard for civilian life, with 30,000 dead lying under the ruins. Regardless of the numbers, the effect on the Allies is swift. The very next day, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill lifts the ban on pursuing targets that will inevitably lead to civilian deaths. The first attack is against Gelsenkirchen that same night, and although the 96 bombers in the sortie are supposed to target mainly oil installations, poor targeting sites on the planes lead to only 24 planes hitting their targets. The rest drop their ordnance on private houses, villages, and the city. Hundreds of German civilians are wounded or killed. They continue with raids on Hamburg and Bremen in the night of May 17th to 18th, wounding 127 and killing 47 civilians. Attacks on Cologne, Duisburg, Dusseldorf, and Hannover have similar results. Meanwhile, on May 20th, far away in the east, the Japanese have collected their data and start Operation 101, a concerted effort of regular bombing aimed at civilians to break the morale of the Chinese in Chongqing. The operation will last at least until November of this year. But terror is not only coming from the air this month. In Poland, the Soviet NKVD continues eliminating thousands of possible anti-communists while further west the Germans continue forcing more and more Jews into the ghettos, as well as killing and incarcerating possible Polish resistance activists. 
It is within this context that a new concentration camp opens based on Theodor Eicher's Dachau model that we talked about last month. Since the beginning of the year, 300 Polish Jews and 39 Polish prisoners from Dachau have been forced to reconstruct a set of Polish cavalry barracks from the Habsburg era near the town of Oswiecim into a fully functioning concentration camp. The commander of the new camp is Eiches protege Rudolf Höss. On May 20th, Höss, his guards and the remaining construction prisoners are joined by inmates number 1 to 30. Relocated from the Saxon housing camp, they are made up mainly of violent criminals who will now become prisoner guards and capos. Concentration camp Auschwitz I is now open for business. Theodor Eike is not there for the opening, though. You see, he is presently in France. Back in September last year, as head of the SS Totenkopfverbände, Eike went to Poland to coordinate a large part of the Einsatzgruppen mass murders and incarcerations. In October, he is given the task of creating an armed division made up of his goons and German-speaking Poles that have excelled in murder and torture of their countrymen. This division is going to be part of the new Waffen SS. At first named Kampfgruppe Eike, it is soon rebaptized as a 3rd SS Division Totenkopf. When the invasion of France starts, they are at first held in reserve. On the 16th of May, they are finally deployed to Belgium to fight towards the coast. By May 23rd, his division is part of the forces driving the Brits towards Dunkirk. Eike is keen to prove his mettle in battle. He has been ordered to cross the La Basse Canal, but only when enough support has built up. Until then, he shall wait. Eike ignores the command and crosses the canal, only to find himself in a pitched battle with British forces that inflict serious casualties on the Germans. By the 27th of May, the British lines are breaking, though. The Germans have cut off the line on other sections, and in front of Eike's division is now a group of isolated British soldiers from the 2nd Battalion Royal Norfolk Regiment. They dig in to fight, but they have the entire 3rd SS Division Totenkopf coming down on them, and soon they are routed. 99 Brits are taken prisoner. The SS marched them off to the nearby Rue de Paradis and positioned them between a ditch and two German machine guns. Whoever isn't killed by the guns is stabbed by bayonets or shot point-blank with sidearms. But what about the war crimes by Great Britain and Germany when taking the war to Norwegian waters, declaring total submarine warfare and attacking neutral ships? What about the German invasion of Denmark, Norway and the Benelux countries? Great Britain's invasion of Iceland? Yes, by the Hague Convention of 1907, these are war crimes, but when you start diving into the matter, you quickly get a headache from the impossibility of weeding out the legalities, politics, and crass reality of war. Therefore, I am only going to conclude that for all practical purposes, the 20th century modern war has now made the laws of neutrality established in the 19th century and before the Great War obsolete and dysfunctional. And these laws have not yet been replaced with a functioning legal framework. If they weren't already broken, it is these events that puts the last nail into their coffin. And think about it. Is really the breach of neutrality the big crime here? Isn't the real crime the war itself and how it is being fought? One thing is certain, already after nine months of war, we are seeing a continuous escalation of ruthlessness on the Nazi German Soviet and Imperial Japanese side. For the ordinary people on the street, this has been especially felt coming from the sky, already killing thousands of men, women and children that were not part of the war in any way. And now, after Rotterdam, these methods are gradually being embraced by the Allies too. In short, the gloves are off and it sure as hell isn't going to get any better. Mm -hmm.